Hello, everyone. Happy Friday, and welcome to another LandFX webinar. My name is JR, and I work in the Client Success and Manufacturer Connection Departments here at LandFX. Hannah Conover is here for part two of her GIS series today, talking about GIS and flood risk management. Hannah is currently a junior at Cal Poly State University here in San Luis Obispo, California, and we are extremely excited to have her here uh, with us again. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. First of all, the webinar is being recorded, which will be uploaded later on today for you to fall back on. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A button down at the bottom there, and we would be happy to pass those along to Hannah. As always, the chat box is there and is a great place for any comments, banter, or just to chat amongst yourselves. Lastly, if you are viewing this in full screen and you wish to exit out, if you head toward the top, you should see an exit full screen option, or you can hit the escape key and that should minimize it for you. With all of that said, I would love to now turn this over to Hannah. Hello. This is GIS and flood risk management. I am a third year student at California Polytechnic State University in San Luis Obispo. I am studying bioresource and agricultural engineering along with geospatial information systems, technology, and software development. I currently work for Blue Diamond Growers in geospatial relations, and I also work for GIS um, in, for Land IQ and Forest Service. So this is the current flood risk concerns and outdated management. Um, rise, we are seeing rising flood concerns in California. Um, this is um, primarily due to increasing intensity of storms and actually wildfires. Uh, wildfires will um, blanket out trees and leave roar room and erode sediment that can cause more flood damage. Um, and the ages, uh, the state's aging infrastructure, such as levees and dams, is also an important factor in contributing to the flood risk management and uh, increasing flooding. Uh, climate change is only um, exacerbating this problem as sea levels rise and will continue to rise, and also the increasing the likelihood of coastal flooding and storm surges. Um, efforts to mitigate flood risk in California include updating infrastructure, improving emergency preparedness, and encouraging sustainable land use practices to reduce the impact of floods. In the more recent flooding event, as the Tulare Lake flooding in 2023, earlier this year, um, more than 680 structures have been destroyed in Tulare County. And we also can see the San Luis Obispo flooding event. Uh, that happened in the same storm as the Tulare Lake flooding. Um, obviously, no good. Um, there's also rising flood concerns just in the entire United States and um, the entire world. Right here, we can see the Iran flooding damage in earlier this year of 2023. Uh, floods have devastating economic impacts, both in the short and long term. Floods damage businesses and infrastructure and homes, uh, disrupt supply chains, transportation, and labor. In addition to the immediate economic impacts, floods can also have long-term effects on region econ regions' economic development, such as decreased uh, property value, reduced investment, and increased insurance loss. Um, we are estimating the structural damage from flooding is projected to cost $13.5 billion in 2022 and over $16.9 billion by 2052. So obviously costs for flood damage is steadily increasing. <laughs> and it's not just in the thousands, it's in the billions, which is a huge concern. And so let's take a quick look at brief history of flood risk management. Historically, flood risk management strategies focusing on controlling and manipulate rivers through channelization and damming. Um, this aimed to protect uh, human settlements and agricultural lands. In the mid 20th century, large scale engineering projects such as the Tennessee Valley Authority and the Mississippi Flood, uh, Mississippi Rid River Flood Control Project. Uh, were implemented, which resulted in widespread alteration of river systems. 
However, these strategies are ineffective and created unintended consequences, such as increased erosion, loss of wetlands, and altered river hydrology leading to downstream flooding. And so here we see the Mississippi River, and it's actually referred to as the America, America's Achilles heel. Um, it's been proven to be ineffective in regards to uh, preventing flooding in the Mississippi River. And that's why it's called America's Achilles heel. And additionally, these strategies often fail to account for social and environmental impacts on communities. In the 1960s and 70s, there was a shift towards non-structural approaches to flood risk management, such as floodplain zoning and flood insurances. However, these approaches were often reactive rather than proactive. And most recently, there has been renewed focus on adopting sustainable integrated flood risk management strategies, which prioritize nature based solutions, community involvement, and multi stakeholder collaboration. This approach to seeks to manage flood risk by working with natural systems rather, rather against them and promoting resilience and an adaptation in the face of climate change. Here we see is a dam failure that. Uh, threatens a Dow chemical complex and it created a super fun uh, cleanup. Not that good. And so who is responsible for managing um, flooding? Um, obviously the government is responsible. Floods can have a imp significant impact on public safety infrastructure, homes and businesses, which is on the government's responsibility to protect. Um, the government has the authority and uh, resources to implement policies and programs that can mitigate the risk of flood and reduce the impact of floods where they occur. The government could coordinate with stakeholders, such as private businesses and community groups to develop effective strategies for managing flood risks. The government can also help fund research and develop new technologies and approaches to managing flood risks. And obviously the government can provide financial assistance to individuals that have been majorly impacted by floods. And also, I really believe that commercial firms have a huge responsibility with floods. And this is partly due because civil and landscape engineering firms are well positioned to manage Floods due to their expertise in designing and construction, constructing infrastructure that can withstand natural disasters. Effective flood risk management can involve a range of strategies, including designing stormwater management systems, improving drainage infrastructure, constructing flood barriers, and implementing flood warning systems. Um, civil landscape engineers also play a huge role in promoting sustainable development practices as well as um, they can also help reduce the cost of, in of insurance premiums and enhance value of properties located in flood prone areas. Um, right here, we have a picture of a possible uh, sustainable flood management um, drainage system that I believe civil engineering firms are well above and be able to capable uh, to design such a system. And so this is where GIS can play a future role and also plays a current role in flood management. Um, GIS can be used to map flood risk areas and analyze the potential impact of flooding on communities. They can also identify places that are vulnerable to future flooding events and enable emergency responders to plan for evacuation routes and other disaster response measures. GIS, GIS can also be used to analyze data from various sources such as weather data, terrain data, terrain data, and infrastructure data to model and predict flood risks. This technology can be used to develop flood hazard maps which can provide valuable information to stakeholders such as insurance companies, urban planners, and local government officials. Um, GIS can also be used to monitor and manage flood events in real time. And they can also integrate different data sets, allowing for more comprehensive understanding of flood risk factors and their interdependencies. With the event, advent of new technologies such as LIDAR and satellite imagery, GIS can provide more accurate 
day information, as well as improve flood risk communication for providing visualizations of flood risk areas and potential impacts, which can be easily understood by stakeholders and also the community. Uh, GIS technology uh, flood risk can be better managed as well. And so who benefits from this? The community does, emergency responders, insurance companies, urban planners, and local government officials, as well as businesses, researchers, and academics, environmental organizations can benefit as well. Ultimately, anyone who lives, works, or has a stake in flood prone uh, areas can benefit from GIS technology as it can help improve the management of flood risks resulting in enhanced public safety, reduced property damage and improved disaster response. JR, is there any current uh, questions? Not at the moment, thank you. All right, awesome. So let's really dive into this. This is flood risk data collection and mapping. So first off on the data collection, we have aerial remote based collection, satellite imagery, aerial photography and LIDAR can provide data on topography, land use and surface characteristics of the flood prone area. Unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, Equipped with cameras and sensors, sensors can provide high resolution aerial imagery of the flood prone area, as well as data on the topography and vegetation infrastructure. So, as well as we have ground based collection, ground based uh, sensors such as water level gauges and stream flow meters can be installed in flood prone areas to collect real time data on flood events and inform flood forecasting models. Radar, radar and microwave sensors can be used to collect data on soil moisture, which is a key factor in determining flood risk. Higher soil moisture will increase risk of flooding when rain is in the forecast. And right to on the right of the slide, we see multi-beam sonar, which can be used to collect data on flood prone areas, including information on water depth, velocity, and flow rate. Pretty cool if you ask me. Other data collection uh, methods, we have sharing based data collection. So local, local government agencies can also collect data on flood risk, including information on draining infrastructure, flood control structures, and emergency response plans from businesses and engineering firms. Uh, data sharing agreements can be established between different stakeholders, such as utilities, transportation agencies, and emergency responders to share data on infrastructure, traffic patterns, and other factors that can impact flood risks. Uh, citizen involvement-based data collection, citizen science initiatives can be used to collect data from residents living in flood-prone areas, such as an information on flood events, water levels, and property damage. Social media and other online platforms could be used to collect data on flood risks, including real-time reports for residents in flood prone areas, as you know, as, as we all know, well know, um, when something happens, people like to post it. So right to the right of the slide, we could see a, a map of uh, current junctions, drains, buildings, and uh, subcatchments, which is obviously important for modeling flood events, because this helps us to know where the water might go, as well as it, when it might stop filling up the drainage and start just flooding all over the streets. So mapping flood zones and identifying at-risk areas, GIS technology can be used to uh, map flood zones and identify areas that are at risks of flooding. So one of these ways is through data layering by combining top topographical uh, data, hydrology, hydraulical data, and other re relevant data, GIS can provide a detailed and accurate view of flood prone areas. And we can see that right here in, um, at, at the right, this is different data layers of land use, distance to river, soil types, and rainfall. Um, that's an example of data layering. And symbology flood maps can be used to 
can be created using GIS technology, which can show the extent of flooding in different areas and help stakeholders understand the potential impact of flooding on their communities. So right here, we could see coloration symbology as well as up here, low risk uh, colors versus high risk. Zonal boundary conditions, GIS can be used to identify areas that are at risk of flooding based on factors such as proximity to rivers and other bodies of water, elevation, soil type, and land use, which we also see right here. So this is zonal boundary conditions with distance to river. And then heat mapping by overlaying different data sets, such as population density and infrastructure data. GIS can help identify vulnerable populations and critical infrastructure that may be impacted to floods. So here we have, um, it's also symbology and heat mapping as high risk is displayed in dark blue versus low risk is displayed in a very light blue to white. And so we have heat maps of this risk that runs through, obviously, over here, very high risk, over here, high risk, and then right here in the middle of Colorado, very low risk, high risk, higher risk areas up here, very very effective in helping people understand and just um, where they're at risk. And so right here as well, we have a, have a FEMA flood map, and this really helps uh, display flood zone and as well as flood hazards. And so we have the selected boundary uh, that we have all our um, display data. And so right here we have with uh, the flood mapping uh, data all around here. And as well as we have our chances of flood hazard areas and future conditions, area with reduced flooding risk to levy and area with flood risk due to levy, all displayed right here on the map for easy understanding of anyone that needs to understand this data, whether you're the government officials, you're businesses, you're the public. Um, cool thing about FEMA flood maps is a lot of them are also um, interactive on their websites. So uh, the public or businesses can interact with these, um, these GIS maps rather than just staring at a hard piece of paper on their desk. So sensor data integration mapping as well. So we can integrate um, current weather forecasting into flood risk models. So such as rainfall intensity and distribution, wind speed and direction and temperature can provide valuable input for flood risk models. With the integration of weather data, Flood risk models could be updated in real time, allowing for more timely and accurate flood warnings and evacuation orders. The integration of weather data can also help in identifying areas that are more susceptible to flooding, as current weather conditions can increase the likelihood of floods occurring in specific areas. And GIS flood risk models can use weather data to simulate different flood scenarios, allowing for better planning and decision making in terms of flood mitigation and management. So as you can see, we could take the rainfall observations, turn into rainfall forecasting, discharge observations and drainage, and then overlay it into a hydrological, hydrological model. And that's where we can start to create discharge simulations and uh, possible warning levels rather than just uh, the government uh, telling people to prepare for rain, we can show them how much rain could be um, spilling all over the streets. <laughs> Integration of current weather uh, forecasting into flood models can also be uh, help emergency responders. Um, and this can help them uh, understand potential impact of floods, allowing for more effective response and planning and resource allocation. 
The integration of weather data into GIS flood risk models can also be useful for insurance companies as it allows for better risk assessments and pricing for properties located in flood prone areas. With the use of advanced technologies such as remote sensing and machine learning, GIS flood risk models can integrate weather data in a more automated and accurate manner, further improving the accuracy of flood risk predictions. So right here to the right, we have a real-time flood forecasting based on a high-performance 2D hydrodynamic model and numerical weather predictions. Pretty fancy words, but in the end, it takes um, real-time flood forecasting and displays it in an easy manner for other people to understand. And so here we also have uh, Tulare County. It's a simple damage display uh, with Esri GIS account. I was a, uh, through my university, I was able to access public data layers through the community contents page. I was able to dis uh, live display desired layers on my own online map. And I really do believe government agencies and public researchers need to adopt sharing GIS data layers to enhance all Esri GIS users uh, access to imperative flood data. And as we can see, we have our 100-year floodplains and we have our 500-year floodplains. Interestingly enough, a lot of the damage was done in the 500-year floodplains, which shows that this was a very historical flood event and we were not properly um, prepared for such an event. Um, because we're used to seeing things in the 100-year floodplains, but obviously they cross into the 500-year floodplains and even all the way out here into the mountains, which is pretty crazy. So creating GIS-based flood warning systems. Uh, Real-time monitoring of of water levels and weather conditions. GIS-based flood sporting systems can incorporate real-time monitoring of water levels and weather conditions to provide accurate and timely flood warnings, obviously. So real-time monitoring of water levels and weather conditions could provide valuable data for flood warning systems, allowing for early detection and warning of uh, potential flood risks. And then real-time monitoring data that can be used to uh, create flood induction maps, which can show the extent of potential flood events and help emergency responders to plan for flood events. So GIS flood warning systems can be used uh, real-time monitoring data to predict the potential impact of flood events on infrastructure, buildings, and transportation networks. So this is a big difference. You'll see an hourly collect data is more imperative for real-time data collection and analysis. This is a weekly data collection. This is hourly. So obviously we're seeing much more um, variations um, with whatever uh, data we could be collecting with. We could be, uh, whether it's monitoring uh, streams, uh, precipitation, or uh, road conditions hourly, is much more imperative for accurately producing flood risk models and warning the public and businesses about incoming uh, flood events. We don't want to be one data point Dave's here when it comes to um, public health and public risk. And then right here as well, we see um, how real time uh, flood data can be taken. Um, this is just a nice little diagram and how it's done or how it could be done. So the integration of real-time monitoring data with GIS-based flood warning systems can help local authorities to make improved decisions about evacuations, road closures, and resource allocations. Obviously, GIS-based uh, flood warning systems can use real-time monitoring to create automated flood warning alerts that are sent to residents and businesses in a flood flood prone area via text message, email, or social media. Um, this could also help reduce uh, flood risk risk related damages, improve the safety of residents and businesses. And the integration of real-time monitoring data with GIS-based flood warning systems can help local authorities and emergency responders to plan for different flooding 
flooding scenarios and develop flood mitigation strategies. So right here, we have uh, flood monitoring from water level sensors um, using real-time data as the flood uh, advances. And this could be used to send out automated text alerts to people in this area about the how much the flood is rising uh, versus time. So also what's important is the integration of current traffic data. Uh, GIS-based flood warning systems can integrate current traffic data to provide more accurate and timely flood warnings and evacuation orders. Traffic data can be used to identify areas that may become inaccessible due to flooding, allowing emergency responders to plan for and allocate resources accordingly. Um, this could also help local authorities to identify potential traffic cog uh, so, uh, hot spots during a flood event, allowing for better traffic management. Yeah, congestion, hot spots. Uh, GIS uh, based flood warning systems can be used, uh, can use traffic data to create evacuation routes that avoid flooded areas and congestion providing a safer and more efficient evacuation process. Real-time data can be integrated with GIS-based flood warning systems to provide updated information on road closures and traffic conditions, allowing for more accurate and timely evacuation orders. GIS-based flood warning systems can use traffic data to predict the potential impact of flood event on transportation networks, allowing local authorities for, uh, to plan better. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but when I try to go look up road closures uh, because of flood events, it's really difficult to find like a nice website provided by the government that accurately shows what's um, being closed. It'd be nice to see it on a map rather than just give uh, bullet bullet points of what may be closed or possibly closed. So this is an example of traffic mapping with real-time traffic and road con uh, conditions. As you can see, as what becomes congested, it is accurately displayed onto a map. And as well, traffic data could be used to identify potential transportation routes for emerging responders during a flood event. And as well as uh, it can identify areas that may require immediate transportation infrastructure repairs. And GIS flood warning systems can use traffic data to create simulations of different flood scenarios, allowing for better planning and decision making in terms of evacuation routes and use resource allocation. Uh, overall, it can uh, help reduce the risk of injuries and fatalities during a flood event, improving the safety of residents and emergency responders. Uh, people should know what roads are safe to take during a flood evacuation order rather than not. So we're not in fear of cars being blocked up, people uh, getting injured or possibly losing their life trying to cross flooded uh, roads because the county or the government or emergency responders did not inform them on what roads are okay to take. So right here we can see as a flood persists, what places uh, are be are able, you're able to travel across versus not. Um, so you can see closures increase as the flood persists. Um, this needs to be available to the public. Um, yeah. So that's actually a great, uh, that last statement was a great little segue. Laura's wondering um, where are some of the best places to like collect this data? Is this public information that can be downloaded um, or where's, where can it be located? Um, I think it'd be best to set up like a, um, a system how Google has it, where Google can analyze uh, traffic data in real time and you're able to go onto Google and see um, where there's like blockage in a route or something like that. And I think that's uh, that's done through traffic sensors and everything like that. It would be a matter of 
data sharing. And so uh, government sectors responsible for public transportation need to data share traffic data um, with people, with government and businesses that um, monitor floods and everything like that. Um, so they could be, so they could display this data. A lot of what we'll talk about here is how data sharing is imperative for flood risk management because not just a single business or a single branch of government can monitor all this. This needs to be a collaboration and collective effort. Does that answer the question? It, it sounds like it might. Um, I'm sure Laura will jump back in if, if there was a little bit more specifics. Awesome, thank you. All right, no problem. So here we are, uh, emergency response planning. So automating alerts and notifications a better way. Um, a GIS-based warning system can be used. Automated alerts and notifications to provide residents and businesses in flood-prone areas with information on local emergency shelters, resources, and support services. The use of automated alerts and notification in GIS-based flood warning systems can help reduce the risk of property damage and personal injury during a flood event. Um, GIS flood warning systems can use historical data to improve the accuracy of automated alerts and notifications, allowing for better predictions of potential flood risks. Um, they can be used on, on a customized basis out of the severity and location of potential flood events allowing for targeted messages to specific areas and communities. The integration of flood uh, of GIS-based flood warning systems with other emergency management systems can improve coordination and communication during a flood event, allowing for better resource allocation and response times. So here we have on the right uh, alert process for flood events. We'll see the data management side We'll see the stage forecasting models, then the induction modeling, and then we'll send out alerts. Um, and the alerts should be um, prioritized to areas in flood, uh, flood prone areas. It should alert everyone as well as what uh, roads are potentially gonna be flooded, safe routes to take. But we also don't wanna span people that are far away from flood events about flooding and cause unnecessary panic. And we also don't want to send messages to people in flood prone areas saying, hey, the rain's coming, watch out. That's not helpful. That's not good information. And that's not going to result in people staying safe. Um, more on it. So uh, it could obviously create evacuation plans and identify emergency shelters, resources, and support services. Um, they, uh, GIS emergency response planning can use predict the potential impact of flood event on critical infrastructure, transportation networks, and buildings, allowing for better planning and decision making. And as well as they can use simulation tools to model different flood scenarios, as well as um, planning in using uh, real-time monitoring data to track the track progression of a flood event and adjust emergency response planning accordingly. Obviously, if we know there's a hospital or su such uh, that is in a flood pro prone area, we're not gonna, we should alert emergency responders and saying, hey, this part of the flood is impacting this hospital. You should not bring people here that have been hurt in the flood event to this hospital, that would be ineffective. Um, things like that could be easily tracked and coordinated over GIS emergency response planning methods. So here is an example. Um, this is a flooding uh, war game simulation platform for training emergency response responses with the utilization of GIS. So mapping of evacuation routes and safe zones. GIS could be used to map multiple evacuation routes and safe zones, providing residents and emergency responders with options in the event that certain routes or zones may become unavailable or overcrowded. 
Um, GIS can take into account factors such as flood risks, traffic patterns, and available resources, allowing for the creation of optimization and optimized evacuation plans. GIS can be used to provide real-time updates and information on the status of the evacuation routes and mapping of evacuation routes and safe zones with GIS can be customized based on the specific needs of different communities, such as the location of hospitals, emergency shelters, and support services. So right left, we're gonna, we see the Hernando County evacuation map in response to a flood event. And we see all sorts of uh, mapped routes and something like this available to the public on a common uh, public website would be extremely helpful. And so GIS can identify potential barriers to evacuation. Um, so, and then also it could be integrated into the other emergency response management systems, allowing for better coordination and community and communication during a flood event, as well as GIS can be used to improve residents and emerging responders uh, with up-to-date information on the location of road closures, traffic patterns, and other potential hazards during a flood event. And this could be done with enabling um, emergency responders to send pinpoints of places that actively become unaccessible or highly flooded to um, uh, GIS mapping um, managers so they could actively input that data into the map and re-upload it in current time. Um, GIS can be used to engage, engage with the community and provide information on evacuation routes as well. So we have next long-term planning and mitigation. Is there any questions? Not at the moment. Thanks for checking. No problem. So this is a potential GIS-based flood mitigation process. As saying before, it cannot just fall onto one person. So the government uh, can fund data collection to research groups, provide public maps, data, and layers on flood hazards, mobilizing automated alerts and emergency response planning, contracting business firms, and providing open flood forums to the public. Civil environmental meteorology and landscaping firms do a better job at managing data collection sensors, imaging processing, and mapping development. This would be done through contracts. They can provide flood analytics and relaying uh, real-time data. They can estimate construction damage, redesign infrastructure, and engineer new flood mitigation. Research groups provide environmental and flooding research. They share data to business firms and the public and the government. They can manage data collection centers, imaging processing, and mapping development. Um, first responders can utilize public maps to enhance flood response protocols, as well as relay um, real-time updates on um, floods. And the public can stay up to date to provide on provided public flood maps, as well as utilize open flood forums to report concerns and share flood updates slash events. So as discussed before, uh, GIS can identify potential flood hazards. Um, this, as we see here, we have stage one, then the flood map, uh, shelter suitability, um, as well as right here, we could integrate climate scenarios, rainfall events, subcatchments, collection and precipitation. And this should all be done, uh, should species start utilizing for future flood mitigation control, as well as we need to start projecting climate change into our uh, flood maps. So right here to the right, we see percent change in days above flooding stage between the years of 1970, 1999, compared to 2000 uh, to 2023, uh, 2030. We're, we're seeing a huge change um, in percent change in, in flooding, right? All this red is the future here. Um, 
or what has happened or what's going to happen. So we are seeing um, flood, flood risk change and it's not changing for the better, it's changing for the worse. So GIS can be used to analyze and project the potential impacts of, of climate change on flood patterns, allowing for more accurate and effective long-term planning and mitigation strategies um, as seen here on the left. And GIS can be used to monitor and track changes in flood patterns and hazards over time, and allowing for adjustments and adaptations to long-term planning and mitigation strategies. Uh, we can incorporate different climate control models um, and that helps inform decisions making and planning efforts for the future. And GIS can be used to create interactive uh, maps and models to allow stakeholders to visualize the potential impacts of flood of uh, different climate scenarios on, on flood patterns, helping to inform decision-making and planning efforts. So we can also incorporate uh, data on land use development patterns and infrastructure for long-term planning and mitigation. Um, we can, uh, GS can be used to evaluate the potential impact of development and land use changes on flood risk in different areas, allowing for better decision making. And uh, GIS can be used to identify critical infrastructure, to, as discussed before, such as hospitals, fire stations, and utility facilities. Um, and GIS can be used to access the potential impact of different infrastructure improvements, such as stormwater management systems or green infrastructure on flood risk in different areas. So right here to the right, we see um, land cover changes, population growth, and, and road density being incorporated into um, a flood projection, projection map. And GIS can be um, identify areas that are at risk of flooding due to aging or inadequate uh, infrastructure, allowing for targeted improvements and upgrades. Um, and GIS can track areas that are at risk of flooding due to land patterns such as urbanization or deforestation. Um, GIS can be used to integrate data from multiple sources such as development permits, zoning regulations, and transportation plans to create comprehensive flood risk maps that incorporate all relevant data. And GIS can be used to engage the community and stakeholders allowing for better collaboration and coordination of long-term flood planning and mitigation efforts that take into account local land use patterns and infrastructure needs. GIS can be used to create predictive flood, uh, models of future flood risks that incorporate changing land use patterns and infrastructure improvements that allow for accurate and long and effective long-term planning and mitigation strategies. So right here, we see a map of energy infrastructure with FEMA and national flood hazards in New York City. And so we see areas of minimal flood hazard. Uh, we see petroleum product terminals mapped out. We see natural gas plants per, um, mapped out. And then we see the chances of flood hazards and we see a regulatory floodway. Uh, obviously mapping important things like uh, hospitals, power infrastructure and um, other necess uh, human necessaries um, onto flood risk models we can um, better plan. And so let's just real, real cap, uh, recap case studies. So one would be the Netherlands Room for uh, Room for River program, where they effectively use GIS to map and model um, their plans to make room for a river to roam to reduce flood risks. We can also see the U.S. Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, Flood the Hazard Mapping Program. And what's cool about FEMA is they provide a lot of local uh, maps to at-risk flood areas. The United Kingdom's Flood Risk Management System incorporates GIS. Um, This has system has been successfully in, 
successful in reducing flood risks and improving emergency response. We also have the City of New Orleans floodplain management program. Um, this is especially responsive uh, to hurricanes. And then we have the Indo Indonesian government early warning systems for flood and landslides. And this system uses GIS to integrate data on rainfall, river levels, and other factors to create real-time flood and landslide hazard maps. So analysis of effective effectiveness of GIS in reducing flood risks. This we can have accurate mapping, real-time flood monitoring, effective communication, improved infrastructure planning, improved use, land use planning, and improved risk assessment. Overall, the use of GIS in flood risk management and mitigation efforts have been shown to be effective in reducing the risk of flood flooding and improving emergency response. However, the effectiveness of the GIS uh, base flood risk management depends on several factors, including the quality of data used, the level of stakeholder involvement, and the availability of resources for, implement, for implementing mitigation measures. So it's time for a Q&A. Awesome. Great presentation, Hannah. We, uh, it's really neat to see that across the board, clearly it's not just isolated to any one city, state, country, province. It's really across the board that this can be really super detrimental and helpful to the way that we plan for um, the increase of atmospheric rivers and climate change as it comes in. If Absolutely. anyone has any questions for Hannah, now is a great time to throw them into the Q&A dialogue box. Hannah, you, Forrest, and I were kind of chatting before the presentation. You talked about, you know, your experience at Blue Diamond and that during, because most of their orchards are here in California, or, or some of them are, um, they had a couple orchards uh, flood. Did they use... Like, do you see this being used in the private sector? Or did you get a chance to kind of see that be used throughout this last year? Um, any of this GIS uh, mapping or data, whatnot? Did they use any of this privately, or were they really trying to rely upon what is available um, publicly in, in government? -wise? Yes, yes, absolutely. So I'll, I manage um, all the, uh, the orchard parcels in GIS. And we're able to see the all the orchards in the flood uh, plain areas, as well as take it account for the recent flooding. And this helps us um, analyze because okay, uh, Blue Diamond is a co-op. What growers we may or may not want to incorporate into our co-op into the future, based on increasing flooding floodings in these areas. So as as with the Tulare County flooding, we saw a lot we saw a lot of floods into the um in in the orchards. And so the United States largest pollination event is actually when beekeepers across the United States come to California to pollinate um almond orchards and nut orchards and in flood in flood in the flooding areas we weren't able to pollinate our orchards effectively because of all the water. And so we're able to see all the orchards that were um, flooded in uh, in GIS and uh, put that into our, in consideration analysis of who do we want to um, incorporate in the future for um, new growers, what areas we want to, uh, plant almonds and what areas we don't want to. And we're starting to realize that areas that are at high risk of flooding um, are prioritized for um, grabbing new growers. That's wild. Um, yeah. I had a question and it slipped. Um, that's really interesting that uh, 
and and vital i mean really to incorporate or invite a new grower into the co-op and allowing them to um if they're a high risk obviously that that kind of affects the bottom the bottom line and uh the reliability upon that orchard or that grower so that's that's really interesting that that you know that that's come on um, yeah yeah go ahead. As, as well as um we actually share haulers so no farmer has their own um hauler to harvest the harvest their nuts obviously we um we don't want to uh, deploy haulers early into areas that may still be at flood risk um, um, depending on the weather. So uh, we want to deploy haulers in areas that aren't at flood risk first as the season, as uh, harvest season comes on early. And then as uh, weather force casting clears up, then we can start deploying haulers into areas that are more at risk of flood flood events as well. That's great. That's really interesting to hear. Um, I don't have any questions that have come in here, uh, but you have provided a wealth of information to everyone that's attended today and future, you know, viewers of this of this webinar. Um, we really appreciate your, you know, willingness to host another webinar and invite us into your experiences and, you know, teach us more about GIS and in this case, flood risk management, because it really is such a, a thing that's at the forefront, I think of most, um, you know, engineers and landscape architects, especially when working on these plans and specifying. Uh, I thank you again. I think that this was a wonderful presentation and I want to thank everyone for joining us today and we will see you all on the next one. I hope that everyone has a great weekend and Hannah, once again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you, everyone. All right. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.